Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening if you're in the UK. Uh, I suppose it's late lunchtime in New York and late breakfast in California. Um, if you're watching this in Australia, I should go back to bed because it's four o'clock in the morning tomorrow and you can watch it on the, on the recording. Uh, everybody goes to the first lecture out of curiosity. Um, it's whether they come to the second that matters, uh, if you're me. Now, when we're on the wonderful Golden Eagle, uh, if we're on the Trans-Siberian trip, of course, we'll be spending most of our time in Russia, but we will be passing through and spending some time uh, in Mongolia. And if you go on the Silk Road trip, we'll be passing through a lot of the areas that were conquered by Genghis Khan. And in both those areas, you'll hear a great deal about them. Statues of Genghis Khan, memorials of Genghis Khan, quotations by Genghis Khan, books about uh, Genghis Khan. So it might be worth having a, a chat about them before we actually get there. Now, mostly history is written by the victors, but that's not the case with the Mongols because they left very little records or archives themselves of what they did. So what we know about them is mostly from their enemies, the people who were conquered, the people who were defeated. There is one possible exception, and that's something called the secret history of the Mongols. Now, it purports to have been written in 1227, a few years after the death of Genghis Khan. The original Mongolian document has never been found. What we have is a Chinese translation from the end of the 14th century. Now, the government of Mongolia accepts it as history. They say, this is fact, this is our history. Academic opinion isn't so sure. There's a strong body of opinion from experts of the period who say this is not fact, this is a medieval forgery. So I'm sitting on the fence on this one. Uh, it's a jolly good read, but remember, it may not be true at all. It may be uh, entirely, entirely fiction. Um, but it is important that we, that we think about him. He's an extraordinary chap. Um, we don't know an awful lot about the man himself. We don't really know what he looked like. This is a Chinese painting done long after his death where they try to make him look more Chinese than Mongol. Uh, and some people say, actually, that's not a picture of Genghis Khan. It's a picture of Kublai Khan, his grandson. So who knows? Um, we don't really know where he was born. There are very many versions as to how he died. And we've no idea where he's buried. Uh, we don't even know really um, what he looked like. What we do know is that he was an extraordinary man who rose from very humble origins in obscurity and abject poverty, who managed to weld together a whole group of warring antipathetic tribes and he turned them into something that became the terror of the known world. He was cruel, but he could also be kind. He was ruthless, but he was also tolerant. He had absolutely no formal education at all. And yet he established a rule of law and an administrative system that lasted long after his death. He was, of course, a Mongol, a race that originated in the area that's now Mongolia and part of uh, Siberia. His birth name was Temujin. Genghis Khan, of course, is a title, not a, not a name. And we think he was born round about 1160, probably on the banks of the Odon River, which is quite near Ulaanbaatar, now the capital of Mongolia. Now, Ulaanbaatar uh, in Mongolian means red hero. And there is a suggestion that Genghis Khan may have been red-haired. Now, that's not as daft as it sounds. I have seen uh, red-haired Gorkhas. They, of course, are, are Mongols. And, and red hair in Mongols is usually caused by vitamin deficiency in childhood. So it's quite possible uh, that Genghis Khan was, was red-haired. We tend to think, of course, of the Mongols as nomadic herders. But Timujin's tribe was a, was a very small, little, obscure tribe who were static. Uh, they lived by the banks of the river. They lived by fishing uh, and hunting. And Temujin was the son of a junior wife. And when his father was killed in one of those constant endemic skirmishes and war between various clans, uh, the tribe threw him out. 
they threw out the two wives, two children of the senior wife, uh, and Temujin and two other children of the junior wife. These were, as far as they were concerned, useless mouths. They could contribute nothing. They couldn't hunt. They couldn't fight. Throw them out. So Temujin found himself abandoned in abject poverty and, and squalor. And although he was the younger of the boys, it seems that it was he who really took control of the family and tried to, to care for them. And at one stage, it appears that he actually killed uh, the elder son of the senior wife. In other words, his, his half-brother. We don't know uh, what they quarreled about. Um, he married. Uh, he was about 12 when, uh, when the tribe expelled them. So at about the age of 16, he married. Now, this was a, a wedding that had been arranged by his father before his father was killed. And surprisingly, perhaps the potential in-laws stood by the bargain. Uh, so they were married and almost immediately his wife was kidnapped. Now, this was very common amongst the Mongols. You kidnap women from other tribes and this was designed, or probably not designed, but it did prevent uh, inbreeding. But he managed to rescue her just about nine months later when she was heavily pregnant and she produced a son. Whose son was it? Was it Temujin's son or was it the son of the man who'd kidnapped her? Uh, nobody knows, of course, but Temujin did accept the child uh, as his own son. And then when he was 22 or thereabouts, he was captured and enslaved. And this was something else the Mongols did. They would capture people uh, from another tribe and make them a slave. And unusually, Temujin managed to escape from slavery. Not many people did. And this was regarded to be uh, rather a good effort. Well, what was he going to do? Well, he then took service as a mere vassal, the lowest of the low, uh, under the leader of the Karaites, which was one of the more important, one of the larger Mongol tribes uh, ruled by the Ong Khan. And Temujin, over the years, throve in this world of treachery and betrayal and endemic warfare. Uh, he did jolly well and he moved up through the hierarchy of the tribe uh, until eventually he was in a position to actually challenge the, the Ong, challenge the Khan. And he beat him and he killed him. And he then became the ruler of the Karite tribe. He was helped very much by his best friend, who was a man called Jamulka. Now we don't know a great deal about Jamulka, except that he had the pleasant habit of boiling alive um, captured uh, generals, which uh, must have kept the others in line a bit. Jamulka and Temujin eventually fell out. And uh, again, Temujin killed uh, Jamulka and that was, that was the end of him. So having taken control of the Karite, what Temujin now starts to do is to try and unite all these little Mongol clans. And he would take on one at a time. He'd defeat it. He'd offer the men a choice. Join me or I'll kill you. And the women were married into men of his now expanding tribe. And this went on for about 20 years. And eventually in 1206, the Grand Council of the Mongols, which was a sort of assembly of all the chiefs of all the various Mongol tribes, they got together and they acknowledged Temujin as the leader of all the Mongols. And they gave him the title of Genghis Khan, the strong, the fearless, the unyielding Khan. Now he, we reckon, was 46 years of age then. So this process took him 20 years. But at last, the Mongols have one government, one leader, and one military force. But he was still surrounded by potential enemies. So he decided that he would strike first. Now, I'm not going to spend very much time talking about the way the Mongols waged war, because that's really the, the subject of a separate talk. Uh, all I would say is that essentially every Mongol was also a soldier. Every male Mongol was also a soldier. Um, and it was a cavalry army. They moved everywhere on horseback, which meant that they could move very swiftly. Uh, and they moved on these extraordinary little Mongolian ponies. Twelve hands is a big one. They're tiny, and yet they will carry a big heavy man 
all day. Uh, they're not shod. They will eat anything that's available. Quite extraordinary little animals. When we go to Mongolia, uh, you'll have a chance to, to ride one if you, if you wish to. Um, and they're great fun. They're, they're slightly odd because they're very short stride compared to uh, what a big horse feels like. But they're great fun. And these allowed the Mongols to, to move and expand and move very fat, very quickly. Um, as I say, he's surrounded by potential enemies. Uh, so he's going to take them on uh, one at a time. Now, this is a time when China was divided into a number of kingdoms, although they all owed technical loyalty to the emperor who was in Peking, if you're a Cantonese speaker, Beijing, if you're a Mandarin speaker or Peking, as we tend to say. And the area that uh, the Genghis Khan owned, if you like, is the area surrounded by the Red Line. That's, that's Mongolia. And he's going to, first of all, take on the Shishia Chinese who are here. But before he does that, he says emissaries to the Jin Chinese to make sure that they don't get involved. And he makes all sorts of promises to them if they keep out of it. So he takes on the Shishia and he conquers them. And then he decides to take on the Jin. Now he's moved into Shishia, China in around 1209, we think. Two days, two years later, he takes on the Jin and he captures Peking. And the emperor flees down to the south. Now, after that, he decides that his next opponent is going to be the Kirakitai up here. Now, they're a much bigger. Uh, kettle of fish. Uh, he can't just walk in and, and take over. So what he decides to do is to create as much instability as he possibly can first. So he sends people in there and they go around saying, I don't think much of your government. Gosh, your people aren't terribly good. Do you know that your leaders are keeping all the money for themselves and none is spent on you? All the taxes go to buy them more wives and build more palaces. And after a few years, uh, he then sends in his army, by which time nobody uh, in the area has got any faith in their own government. Most of their, the Karakital's army deserts. Uh, and in 1218, uh, he's, he's taken the area. And his little empire gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And once again, the men are given a choice, join me or I'll kill you. And the women are, are married into his, his own tribe. Um, men who won't join him, but aren't killed, but might be useful, are simply turned into slaves. One of the things he starts to find as he moves up into areas that were originally Chinese is artisans, craftsmen, machinery. Now, the Mongols didn't have any machinery. They had craftsmen who could make bows and arrows and saddlery, but that was about it. They didn't have any siege engines, for example, and increasingly as their empire expands and they come across towns, they need siege engines and they find that the Chinese have got them. Now the Mongols were very curious people. When they came across something new that they hadn't come across before, they would say, hmm, what's all this? Can we use this? Is this useful for us? And if it was, then the experts, the craftsmen, were sent back to Mongolia uh, and put to work making whatever uh, the Mongols thought that, that they wanted. It might be siege engines, it might be portable bridges to cross rivers. They didn't have any engineers, but the Chinese did, uh, so they would take some of those. They didn't have letter writers, uh, but the Chinese did, so quite a lot of them were taken uh, under command. His next step is going to be the Sultanate of Khwarezm here, which is actually Persia. Or, or most of most of Persia. Um, that is a much bigger opponent than anything he's done so far. So he's not going to just wander in there and snap it up. He decides that he'll try and uh, maintain reasonable relations with them first. And he'll try to open trade routes with them. So he sends down a caravan of about 500 men, with a whole lot of camels and mules laden with trade goods, goods that he thinks he can sell uh, to the Persians, uh, and, and take something back from them. And the governor of the border province up here, when they meet him, he says, you're all spies, which of course they were, and he killed most of them. And the few that got back to Genghis Khan, they told him what had happened. So Genghis sent two Mongols 
and a Muslim down to see the Shah in Bukhara, who was the, the king of the area. And the Shah took the two Mongols and shaved their heads. Now Mongols then shaved their heads completely, except for a little toupee at the back, uh, which was designed to haul them up to the great blue sky, the great blue heaven when they died. And to shave it off was an appalling disgrace. It was about the worst thing you could, you could do to a Muslim. So he shaves their heads, kills the Muslim and sends the two now shaven Mongols back to Genghis Khan with the head of the Muslim. So as far as Genghis is concerned, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And we're told that he took an army of 200,000. He leads them personally. He's now 60 years of age. And in he goes, he captures the governor of the frontier province. He kills him. And they pour molten silver into the governor's eyes and ears. And all the border soldiers are killed. Some are allowed to join them. The rest are made slaves. And then he heads off to Samarkand. Now, when we are on the Silk Road trip, we, of course, will we go, go through Samarkand. Now, as an aside, when we go to Samarkand and Bukhara and these other wonderful places that, that if you were a schoolboy in an English public school, the great game, all the, the little battles that happened around here with the Russians and the British, um, these are places with great sort of, um, they really sort of lodge in your memory. And um, when the Soviets took over, um, the communists, the Bolsheviks in 1920, uh, they found that all these various places had rather been allowed to go to rack and ruin. So they restored them. It was one of the few good things the Soviets did do uh, in Central Asia and the Caucasus. So when we go to Samarkand or Bukhara, all these various places, you think, crikey, this is absolutely super. But actually, only part of it is original. Part of it is original. The rest is a restoration. But it's been restored uh, exceedingly well. So when you go into Samarkand today, uh, apart from the McDonald's, obviously, uh, you're looking at what Genghis Khan saw all those, all those years ago. And he goes to Samarkand, he kills the military garrison, kills them all, forms the civilian population up in the mosque, personally rides into the mosque on his Mongolian pony, and he says, I am the scourge of God, and I have come to scourge you. Get outside. And they go outside, and they're all killed, and a great pyramid of the heads is built. And the river that ran through Samarkand is diverted to go over the Shah's birthplace. The Shah was born in Bukhara, uh, in Samarkand, I'm sorry. And then he moves on to Bukhara. And he took Bukhara in 1220. Again, he personally rode into the town. The final battle uh, with the Persians was at a place called Urgensh, which again is somewhere else that we see on the Silk Road. It's 500 miles east of the Caspian and it's now in Uzbekistan. Now that particular battle involved fighting through built up areas, fighting through buildings. Nobody likes fighting through buildings. Not the Mongols, not us today. Nobody wants, to, you don't want to do it. The reason you don't want to do it, it's very difficult to keep control uh, and it takes normally very heavy casualties. And there were a lot of Mongolian casualties. And because a lot of Mongolians were killed, uh, he formed up his army. And we're told that he ordered 50,000 Mongols to kill 24 civilians each. So if that's right, then 1.2 million civilians have been killed. Now that, of course, has got to be absolute nonsense. Um, it's very unlikely for a start that he could have kept an army of 50,000 uh, in the field for that length of time. It's probably a lot less than that. And there certainly weren't anything like 1.2 million civilians available to be killed. But the Mongols didn't just wage war with swords and shields and spears and bows and arrows. They also used propaganda. And if you're the next town down the line and you hear that the Mongols have killed 1.2 million people, you're maybe not so inclined to resist when the Mongol army appears uh, over the horizon. So after taking most of Persia, Genghis Khan's empire is getting bigger and bigger. And what he now does is he splits the army. He takes half the army and he raids through Afghanistan and Northern India 
and back to Mongolia. He left a garrison in Afghanistan and their descendants are still there, the Hazaras. They live on the west of Afghanistan and any of our British or American viewers who've served in Afghanistan will probably have come across them. Uh, and they, they are the descendants of, of Genghis Khan's Mongol garrison. And when we uh, started sending Gokha battalions from the British army into Afghanistan recently, in the recent campaign, the locals said, hey, what are Hazaras doing in the British army? And our boys said, what are you talking about? We're not Hazaras, we're Gorkhas. But of course, they're both, they're both uh, Mongols. And, and uh, as I say, they're still there in, in the west of Afghanistan. The other half of the army uh, goes up north. It takes over the rest of Persia. Uh, it takes over what is now um, Azerbaijan. It goes up through Georgia. It takes that, gets all the way up uh, to the Volga Bulgars, way up there up in the north, where the Rus are people who gave their name uh, to Russia. The only defeat the Mongols suffered uh, was at the hands of the Volga Bulgars, but it was only one defeat. The Mongols won all the rest of the battles and eventually the Rus, they were the Vikings who went east, the people who gave their name to Russia, they sued for peace. And six princes from the Rus were coming along to negotiate for a peace with the Mongols and the Mongol commanders erected a great sort of platform on, on stilts. The ground was very marshy. And when the six princes arrived, they were greeted. They were invited to sit down under this platform out of the sun. They were fed uh, lots, of, lots of wine and given a very good lunch. And then quite suddenly they were all tied to their chairs. And the Mongols went up on top of the platform to have their lunch and uh, over the next few hours the platform sank down in the mud down and down and down and down and the six princes were crushed to death so Genghis himself is back home in about 1225 and his empire is even bigger and then there's a rebellion in china so Genghis khan goes off he puts it down he dies in 1227, somewhere down here. And he would have been aged about 70 or early 70s. We have no idea how he died. There are all sorts of theories. He died of wounds. He was struck by lightning. He drowned crossing a river. He fell off his horse. He died of pneumonia. The most extraordinary theory, which you'll find in, in some Chinese history books, and ladies, you may wish to cover your ears at this point, and it says that having put down the rebellion, he took a Chinese princess as yet another wife. And the Chinese princess had inserted in her person a mousetrap type device with very, very sharp spikes. And when Genghis attempted to carry out his marital duties and inserted himself, they trap was sprung and it cut off um, <clears throat> part of Genghis's anatomy and he bled to death. Now clearly that is nonsense. It's the sort of thing every schoolboy sniggers over but it's absolute nonsense. It is Chinese propaganda. There's no reason at all uh, not to believe that he died in his bed. For heaven's sake he was at least 70. Now I know 70 now is a ching you're a spring chicken, but um, 70 um, in the 13th century was actually very, very uh, old uh, indeed. Well, his body was taken back to Mongolia and it was buried in a secret grave. The burial party, when they came back from burying him, were all killed, so they couldn't say where the grave was. And several regiment of horsemen were sent off to gallop all over the area to trample up the ground so that nobody could ever find where, where he was buried. Now in 2001, I think it was, there was a University of Chicago archeological team uh, who came across a burial site with a number of Mongol, obviously very senior Mongols buried there. And they rather wondered whether one of them might be Genghis Khan. That, uh, that's still ongoing, we, we simply don't know. Um, if all the accounts of the people he defeated are true, uh, in that he was buried in a secret grave, then obviously uh, 
the findings of the University of Chicago are, are not so, but we must wait and see what they, what they come out with. His conquests were enormous. I mean, in 20 years, he creates an empire which is bigger than that acquired by the Romans. And it took the Romans 400 years to build theirs. And Genghis's empire did last after his death, at least, at least for a while. And in his empire, you progressed by merit. Merit and achievement, and of course, loyalty, were what mattered. But one of the things he had to do was to prevent this internal dissension, this constant feuding between families and, and different clans. And he produces what is called the Great Law. And the Great Law said, kidnapping of women is illegal. It's got to stop. Selling women into marriage, it's got to stop. Enslaving of Mongols is not allowed. You can enslave anyone else, but not Mongols. Animal rustling is illegal. Adultery is illegal, although that doesn't apply to the servants of the man of the house. And all children are legitimate, regardless of whether they're born in wedlock or out of it. And one very modern codicil of the law said that there was to be no hunting between March and October. And the reason for that, of course, was to allow the, the animals to, to reproduce and restock the population. And that's the sort of laws we have now. I mean, we now have hunting seasons for, for just about everything. We have shooting seasons. And the reason for that, of course, is to allow the animal and bird population to, to breed and to restock. Taxes were lowered, constantly being lowered. Doctors didn't pay any tax. Medical doctors didn't pay tax. Priests didn't pay any tax. Education establishments didn't pay any tax. Now, although Genghis himself was, was uneducated and, as I said, probably illiterate, he understood the importance of education. And the Mongols would open up schools and universities, uh, very much using Chinese scholars to, to start them off and tell them uh, how it should be run. Um, and... The other people who didn't pay any tax for some reason is undertakers, funeral directors, no tax. Throughout the empire, free trade. Uh, learning was disseminated. As I said, the Mongols were very curious people. So anything new, they really interested in it. They'd look at it and examine it. And if it was useful to them, they'd, they'd take it aboard. Um, they did produce a script. There was no written Mongolian script before Genghis Khan. Uh, the original script is at the top of your screen. The modern Mongolian is at the bottom of your screen and it's read from top to bottom. Now, currently, Mongolian is written in the Cyrillic script, the same script as, as Russian. And that, of course, is from the, the, uh, the communist uh, domination of, of Mongolia. Uh, but the Mongol government, current Mongolian government, is trying to replace <coughs> the Cyrillic script. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with Mongolian. I I'm not sure whether that's necessarily a terribly good idea because I think if you want to uh, relate to the world, you probably need a script that can be Romanized, but we will see. We'll see how that goes. As far as religion was concerned, the Mongols were animist. They believed in, in sympathetic magic, but at the end of the day, everything was under the great blue sky. The great blue sky was where they went uh, when they died. Much later, much long after Genghis, they, they did become Muslim. Uh, but within the empire, there was complete religious toleration. Jews, Muslims, Christians, fully allowed, allowed to practice uh, and allowed to exist. Uh, no repression uh, whatsoever. When he died, his successor was his third son, uh, Ogadai. And the empire continued to grow. And it went on growing. Um, under Ogadai and, and his successors for about 150 years. The Mongol Empire, at its height, uh, one grandson of Genghis commanded the Golden Horde that's up there on the north. And they got to the gates of Vienna. And the only reason they didn't go any further was that Ogadai, Genghis Khan's son, died in 1241. And the custom amongst the Mongols was that when the Khan died, all the Mongols went back to Mongolia to select the next Khan. In actual fact, of course, what they wanted to make sure was that their interests were represented. So off they went. So the Mongols never went further than Vienna. 
perhaps if Ogodai hadn't died, things might be, might be different. Another grandson pushed in through Persia and into Syria and Iraq and the Middle East. <clears throat> His grandson, Kobla Khan, established the Yuan dynasty in China. Uh, another descendant was Babur, who became the first Mongol ruler of India. I suppose now we still see them generally as barbarians. The Mongols are savages. They were butchers of the innocent. But there was far more to them than that, as I've tried to show. The last ruling direct descendant of Genghis Khan was the Emir of Bukhara, and he was deposed <coughs> by the Soviets in 1920. And Mongolia became a client state of the USSR uh, with a communist government and Soviet troops stationed there. That's a slide showing Mongolia today, surrounded in, in green, and the height of the Mongolian Empire in 1260. Um, the Mongols have kept his memory alive. Uh, after the death of Stalin in 1953, when things started to relax a little bit, uh, Mongolia was uh, admitted into the United Nations in 1960 as a supposedly independent country, although in fact, of course, um, it was very much a client state of the USSR. In 1962, a Mongolian government official, thinking things have got a lot easier, they've relaxed, and he put up a monument to Genghis Khan and issued a stamp with Genghis Khan's spirit banner on it. But that was going a bit too far. Uh, and the communist government clamped down on that. The stamp was withdrawn. The monument was knocked down and the official who thought of it disappeared. But then in 1991, down came the Soviet Union. Soviet troops left Mongolia. And now Genghis Khan is seen very much as a national hero. This extraordinary statue, and we'll see that when we go to Mongolia, the statue itself is 164 feet high, just the statue, that's right? the top of this big building. Um, it's made of stainless steel, God knows what it cost. There is a lift which allows you to go right up uh, and you come out at the top of the horse's head here. Uh, there are also stairs, I did actually walk up the stairs last time, I, next time I might take the lift, uh, but it is quite extraordinary and, and he's very much now in every town there's something about Genghis Khan and, and they very much the Mongols today very much hold on to the, the tradition of, uh, of Genghis Khan. So that's a brief uh, romp around uh, the story of Genghis Khan and his Mongols and I very much hope to see some of you uh, on the wonderful Golden Eagle as we cross Russia and into Mongolia uh, and see what Mongols today look like. Thank you very much indeed uh, for watching. Thank you very much, Gordon. I'll just wait for a few minutes just to um, give some time to people send some questions through if they want to ask any, but that's, it just shows what an extraordinary man he was, I think, that, and the fact that still Mongols today, uh, and I've seen that structure myself that last um, statue is absolutely incredible and I think that just shows just how despite yeah. the fact of how long ago it was that he's still very much you know an important figure there today and I suppose if you could just maybe um, briefly maybe describe to those who haven't yet been to Mongolia what what life in Mongolia is like today is there a, um, obviously a, how how would it compare to say western life um, you know, with, within Mongolia, is it still, is there still some um, signs of the older times in, in Mongolia? There are, uh, there are signs of, there are some temples that are still there, the Soviets didn't get rid of. Um, but there's a funny mix of, of old buildings, um, sort of pre-Bolshevik buildings and the more recent Soviet uh, buildings. The British Embassy, I'm sorry to say, looks rather like a dry cleaners. Um, you know, there's, you, you'll find that a lot of the Mongolians, the Mongols still live in girts, the, these yurts, these, these sort of tent things. Um, and behind the, the, the ger uh, will be a modern 4x4 four four Toyota or, or um, Land Rover or, or whatever. Um, they're still coming to terms with being an independent country. Um, 
they never were independent. They were part of Genghis Khan's empire. Uh, they were then a Khanate or a number of Khanates. Uh, then they were part of the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire. Uh, then they were um, part of the Bolshevik. So it took them some time to develop a, 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 a diplomatic. They're relatively democratic. There's still problems of um, corruption and nepotism. They're potentially uh, quite rich. Uh, they have a lot of raw materials, mostly now being bought up by the Chinese. Uh, which worries some of them because they don't want to be under the thumb of either China or Russia. Um, the restaurants are excellent. Um, they, you can get all sorts of food. I mean, you can get Mongolian food, you can get Chinese food, you can get European food. Um, there are not that many English speakers, but there are more. Each time I go there, I find there are more people who do speak English. Uh, they still uh, follow the old Mongolian sports, um, racing. Now, if we think about racing in our country, we think about five furlongs, seven furlongs, maybe a mile and a half. Um, there they have, and I've seen it, a 10 mile race on these Mongolian ponies at the gallop on ground that is like concrete. Mostly the riders, the jockeys ride bareback just to reduce the weight. And the last time I saw one, they had 116, I think, um, this was last year, 116 entrants for this race. I only saw one loose horse. And I only saw one lame horse. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, archery is a great sport of the, of the Mongols. They still, I mean, they were great archers, of course, in Genghis Khan's time. Uh, their army was, was, was mounted archers. Um, that, that's how they did it. And they still, uh, they still practice archery uh, and wrestling, uh, the other great thing that they do. They're jolly nice people, Mongols. Um, they're interesting. They're interested in us and those who, because they don't see that many foreigners, uh, other than Russians, of course, um, they're quite interested in talking to us. And a, and a Mongol who speaks English will come up and talk to you and he's not trying to sell you anything. Um, he's just, he wants to practice his English. Um, so I, I, it's a jolly interesting place to be. And I think people will enjoy it. In fact, I know they'll enjoy it because I've been there enough times. And our mm -hmm. guests have always thought it was marvellous. And we've, so like you said, we've, obviously we visit Mongolia on the Trans-Siberian journey that we do, but that's only a, a brief visit, but it always comes out as one of the highlights of the journey. So just some of the questions that actually came up was about the trips themselves that we do to Mongolia. And obviously the Trans-Siberian is one of those. Uh, the Trans-Siberian, the classic journey is, is 15 days in length and that only includes just a day trip into Mongolia but you get to see all of the major sites within Mongolia, within Ulaanbaatar, sorry, and we, that's the major stop that we do there but we do all of the main city tours and then we then travel out into the countryside and go and visit the uh, nomadic families out there within um, the Tarelj National Park as well and we get to see the statue that Gordon put up um, on his presentation but if you wanted a more uh, well longer exploration of um, Ulaanbaatar itself then you could do the Trans-Mongolian trip which is 13 days in length and that actually visits the Nadam festival which incorporates those games that Gordon's just mentioned the sports that are the traditional sports of Mongolia so wrestling, horse riding and archery and Nadam itself means the three manly games and that's the big um, national festival that takes place there each July and so we're really lucky to have access to that festival and we go and watch the opening ceremony there and then we go and watch some of the the horse riding and the different activities there so that's a, a huge feature of that journey um, and we did have a question as well just about the uh, the cost and uh, the cost of those trips. The, cost, the prices are all online, but just to give you an indication for the Trans-Mongolian trips, they start the, uh, for 2021, for example, um, in a silver class compartment, they start at £17,500 per, uh, $17, per person, uh, which is the equivalent of about £13,000 per person. And that's a fully inclusive trip from start to finish. That includes everything um, on board the train from the moment you join us to the time that you leave us. 
all of your food and drink and all of the excursion programs as well are fully inclusive within the price. So as we've mentioned, all of the different um, journeys in there. So I hope that answers the questions for those of you who have asked those types of questions. Um, I do have another couple of questions for you, Gordon. Um, just, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question, but um, Adelina McClure has asked what type of gems or minerals can be found in Mongolia? Do you happen to know that answer? I'm, unfortunately, I'm unaware of the answer to that, but. It wasn't, as far as I know, uh, a great source of, of minerals, of, um, of precious stones. They did trade with, with India. Uh, but there was a question of them getting precious stones from India rather than uh, sending any precious stones themselves. I don't think, as far as I know, I've certainly never heard of a native jewel. You know, I don't think they, uh, I don't think they have any diamonds or, or emeralds uh, or anything like that, as far as I know. But um, if I'm wrong, it's not a resigning matter. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, I didn't, because I, I was, I myself wasn't aware of anything in, in that sense. No, no. Um, we have another question here about at the height of the Mongol Empire, did it cover all of what we know today as China? Uh, yes, uh, but it, it was a part of the Mongol Empire, but, but, but slightly separate from it. Um, Kublai Khan, who was Genghis Khan's grandson, um, he was the emperor of China. Now, the rest of the empire was run by other relatives of, of um, Genghis Khan. So you can say that, uh, yes, it was part of the Mongol Empire. Um, Marco Polo met him. Uh, you know, Marco Polo sort of trekked off to China, met Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan had never met a European and was terribly interested in, in what was happening and wanted to know what uh, he could trade with the Europeans. Again, this, this curiosity of the Mongols. So China, yes. Um, le much later on, uh, the Japanese tried to recreate in the 30s, uh, when they invaded China, to recreate um, a Mongol dynasty. Uh, the Manchus were, were Mongols, um, although they interbred a bit, but they were Mongols. And Manchu Guo, which the Japanese tried to turn Manchuria into, uh, was a resurrection, if you like, of the, of the Mongol Empire. It didn't last very long. If anyone has any more questions, you can always email us at mail at getrains.com and we'll answer any of those additional questions that you have. But this hopefully gives you a brief idea. So I'll answer that there for you there. And that's everything. So I think, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed it. And I think Gordon will leave you to go and enjoy gin and tonic. And I might just do that myself as soon as it is the evening. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. It's almost the weekend. So. Thank you, Natasha. <laughs>